In this short tutorial, we will be looking into some of the basics of MaxScript. Our goal will be to build a main floater with three sub rollouts, each housing unique buttons that will give us control over several parameters. We will also construct several floaters that will open independently of the main floater when certain buttons are pushed. Inside of these newly opened floaters, we will create spinners that give us control over specific object properties. Let's begin by first opening a blank MaxScript window. We will make a new section which will later house our independent MaxScript floaters. We will start off by creating the structure of our main floater and its three unique subfloaters. For simplicity's sake, we will use a simple naming convention that will help maintain an easy understanding of our MaxScript as it grows. Each of the rollouts will be called menu, followed by a numerical value. In this case, we have three sub rollouts, therefore, the names will be menu01, menu02, and finally menu03. Below each of these, I am also creating the open and close parentheses that will house the script specific to each individual menu. We will now specify that the name main floater equals a new rollout floater followed by empty quotes and the dimensions of the floater. Next, we will add three menus above the main floater. We will simply do this by typing add rollout space the name of the sub rollout space then the name of the floater we want to add it to, which in this case is the main floater. When we evaluate this by clicking Control E, we can see our new rollout floater with three sub rollouts. We can see the floater hasn't been given a name, and this can be done by simply typing something into our empty quotes and evaluating the script again. But for now, we'll leave it blank. We will also notice that if we continue to evaluate the script, more instances are created without the previous window's closing. This may be desired in some cases, but not in this one. Let's write a simple line of script that will solve this. We can now see that if the floater is open and we evaluate the script again, it first closes the current floater, then generates a new one. Next, we are going to move into our menu01 sub rollout and create a new button called Make Sphere with a display name of Create Sphere, followed by its position and dimensions. We can now evaluate the script and see our button, however, at the moment it doesn't do anything specific. Going back to our script, let's hit enter a few times and make a section where we will define the actions this button will carry out when pressed. We will type on make sphere press do, then create an open and close parentheses that will house our actions. The first defined action will be to create a sphere object with a few predetermined parameters. With the sphere selected after its creation, we will rename the sphere so that it is unique. Now if we evaluate the script and click our button, we will see a sphere created at the origin. If we open our command panel, we can see that the name is correct, and the predetermined parameters are set to the values we specified in the script. However, before moving on with the sphere object, we want to create one more button that will follow the same structure as the sphere, but instead for a box. Below our first button, let's create another button this time with the button name being make box and the display name being create box followed by its position and dimensions. We can then evaluate the script and make sure the button is properly placed. Beneath the script section, we will create another function that will be defining what happens when the make box button is pressed. Like before, we will create the specific object with predetermined parameters, Make sure that it is selected after creation and then assign a unique name to the object. When the script is evaluated and the button is pressed, we can now see that a box with its predetermined parameters is created. With the initial buttons created, we will now create two dormant floaters that when the proper button is pushed will open and display spinners for the specific object, giving us the ability to modify specific object parameters. We will create the first floater, which is going to house our sphere properties and specify its dimensions. Our first sphere property we want to have control over is the radius. We will create a new spinner with the name being S radius and its display name being sphere radius. We will also set the range with the second number being 1000, meaning this is the highest number the spinner can achieve. The third number will be set to 25. This is the number in which the spinner will be set to by default. 
Our second object parameter will be the sphere segments. Like before, we will create the spinner with a unique and relevant name. We will also specify that this spinner's range type will be integer form and set the range properties accordingly. We will once again designate a section below specific to our scripted actions. For our first spinner, we will type on radius changed value do. We now want to type selection.radius equals selection.radius equals value. Let's go ahead and evaluate this again, and when we press the Create Sphere button, we see that our floater doesn't open. This is because we haven't specified how this dormant floater should open and when. Let's drop down to our on make sphere press do action and type create dialog followed by our unique floater name. Now when the script is evaluated and we click our create sphere button, our unique sphere is created and a new window opens which houses our defined object parameters. Now if we change the spinner for our sphere radius, we can see that the number defined in the spinner is changing the selected object's parameter to be equal. We are also able to define a set radius by simply typing in the number to the spinner field and clicking enter. Now that our radius parameter is working, let's move on to the segments parameter. Using the same function as above with a different parameter defined, we are able to control it like the sphere radius. Let's evaluate the script again, and now we can see that not only is our sphere radius working, but we have control over the segments of the sphere as well. Now that we have completed our sphere property floater, let's make a new floater that will house our box properties. Once again, we will specify the name of our floater and its display name as well as the dimensions of the window. Since we are going to be building three spinners for our length, width, and height, we simply define one spinner and copy-paste it two additional times. We will then go through each spinner's name and assign it a unique name that will be relevant to the parameter it will be modifying. Once again, in this case, the parameters will be the length, width, and height of our selected box. With that done, in a designated scripting section, let's define our first spinner that will modify the length parameter. Like our sphere above, we will be replicating the same structure and formula, but change the defined names to match the affected parameter. Once again, when we evaluate the script and press our button, the properties window for the box fails to appear. Let's move down to the proper section of the script and type create dialog, followed by the unique name given to our properties window. We can now see that after evaluating the script and pressing our button, the unique box is created and our properties window opens. We are also now able to change the spinner value for length and see our selected box's length change in unison. Having our length completed, both the width and height parameters need to now be defined. Like our previous functions, we will type the same formula with the proper unique parameter names to control both the width and the height of our box. Let's again evaluate the script and press our button. We can now see that all three spinners are properly linked to the specified box parameters. We can also create buttons for simpler repetitive actions. In our second menu, we're going to create two new buttons that simply run macro scripts for toggling view modes on and off when pressed. I've chosen wireframe and edge view for this demonstration, however, any macro can be assigned to a button in the same way that we are assigning macros here. We can now evaluate the script and see our new buttons located in the proper sub rollout. For our first button function, let's type on wire view pressed do, and then inside the parentheses below, type action main dot execute 
Action 0272. After evaluating the script, let's create a sphere and set the radius and segments higher for easier viewing. If we now click the wireframe button, the assigned macro runs and we can toggle between shaded and wireframe viewing modes. With that working, let's go back to our script and define the macro for our edge view function. We can do this a lot faster by simply copy pasting our wire view function and changing the name and the number of the macro action. I'm going to create a few sphere objects within the viewport. And now when we press both our wireframe and edge face buttons, we can see that the assigned macros are toggling properly. To wrap up our script, let's move to the third menu and add a few labels showing information about the script. Each line will need to have a unique name and within the display name, we will write our information. After evaluating the script, our lines do show up, however, the window is a bit small, and therefore we need to extend it a few pixels. After extending the pixels, we can evaluate the script again to see the scroll bar on the right has disappeared and our subrollouts fit nicely in the specified dimensions. We now have successfully created a basic Mac script that has several unique and helpful applications. We not only can create specific objects, but we have the ability to adjust specific parameters of those objects. We also implemented several buttons that run repetitive macros that could be potential time savers and wrapped up our script with a helpful information section. My name is Jeremy Baldwin, and thanks again for watching eat3d.com.